Hey guys, Mr. Boyd said, uh, along with Christianity, with Jesus, we'd be learning about this dude named St. Patrick. So I looked him up and I found a bunch of stories about him and I thought I'd share some of them with you guys. They're pretty interesting, but but some of the stuff is weird. St. Patrick, patron saint of Ireland, was born in Kilpatrick, Scotland in 387 AD. He was an aristocrat. Isn't that a Disney movie? The son of well-to-do parents of Roman and British descent. His father was a Christian deacon. His mother was a member of a high-class family related to St. Martin of Tours. As a boy, Patrick led a nice lifestyle and was taught in the manner of a proper Roman, including the ancient language of Latin. At the age of 16, Patrick's home was attacked by raiders. He was captured along with thousands of other people. His captors took all of their prisoners by ship across the sea to Ireland. Once there, Patrick was sold into slavery. His master was a Celtic druid, a high priest who worshipped nature and animal spirits. That sounds like something from Dungeons and Dragons. For six years, he slaved as a shepherd, tending his master's sheep. During this time, he learned a great deal about the Druidic religion and its pagan practices. He also learned to speak fluent Gaelic, or Irish Gaelic, which was one of the six Celtic languages. Patrick managed to escape from his master aboard a ship bound for France, and it was eventually reunited with his family. He studied the Catholic faith in France under the direction of St. Germain. He later was made Bishop of Ireland by Pope St. Celestine I, and given the duty of converting the Celts in Ireland to the Christian faith. Patrick never swayed in his beliefs. He traveled the countryside of Ireland, converting both king and commoner. Eventually, the Celts of Ireland set aside their pagan beliefs and became Christians. Patrick founded many churches and is credited with working over a thousand miracles in his lifetime. It is said that St. Patrick raised at least 33 people from dead. He is also said to have banished the snakes from Ireland, healed the sick, cured the blind, and renewed the youth of the aged. Fountains sprang from the ground at his command, and the sea itself was calmed. Tales of his miracles fill book after book written by his followers. Most of these followers went on to become saints themselves. Patrick used his knowledge of the existing Druidic customs to teach the Catholic beliefs. His most well-known example is the use of the shamrock in teaching about the Holy Trinity. The shamrock? Is that like Lucky Charms? This three-leaf clover was already held in great respect by the Celts, who looked to nature as their god. Patrick used the shamrock structure with three leaves combining to form one plant to explain the triune, three in one, the nature of God. Each leaf represented one of the three different persons which are present in God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Each person is unique and separate, just as each leaf of the shamrock is unique and separate. All three leaves combine to make the whole plant, but no leaf loses any of its unique character in the blending. Patrick explained that it is the same with God. All three persons exist together in the one God, but still retain all of their unique qualities. This visual lesson helps us to understand one of the great mysteries of the church, the Holy Trinity of God. St. Patrick's Day, March the 17th, is the anniversary of his death. People all around the world still remember him and celebrate the wonderful works he performed. Together with St. Valentine and St. Nicholas, he continues to be one of the most beloved figures in Catholic Christian history. Wow, this guy did some interesting stuff. Sounds like he did a lot of miracles that were crazy, man. And, and, and we celebrate his death? St. Patrick's Day is the day of his death? That's odd. Normally, it's the birthday we celebrate. And they mentioned St. Valentine 
Does that mean that's Valentine's Day? And isn't St. Nicholas another name for Santa Claus? Is that the Saint of Christmas? Wow. This is some interesting stuff, guys. Now, there's another story here called St. Patrick and the Angel. Let's see what it says about that. Although enslaved in Ireland, Patrick held strong to his faith and trusted that God would not abandon him. But how did he escape? The answer may surprise you. While in captivity, he was visited by the angel Victor. In his dreams, angel Victor? I've never heard of an angel named Victor. That's a funny name for an angel. Victor appeared to him in the form of a bird. The angel told him to have faith, for his freedom would come soon. One day, Victor appeared to him while he was tending sheep. He told Patrick to dig in the earth. If a bird comes to me and tells me to dig in the earth, I think he wants me to find worms. Patrick did as he was told and found a large stash of golden coins buried in the ground. Wow, that bird was pretty smart. The angel then told him to use the coins to buy his freedom. Patrick presented the buried treasure to his master in exchange for his release. His master agreed. Victor told Patrick to go to the sea where he would find a ship. I bet he finds a lot of water there too. The angel said that the ship would not find favorable wind until he arrived. Patrick walked nearly 200 miles to the ocean where he found the ship exactly as the angel foretold. I bet his feet were tired. Meanwhile, his master had changed his mind about releasing Patrick. He looked everywhere for Patrick, but could not find him. When the druid returned home, he discovered that he had not only lost his slave, but the golden coins as well. They had vanished completely. Patrick boarded the ship and sailed first to France and then home. Back home, he met with his family once again and soon began formal training for the Catholic priesthood in France. His dreams of the angel continued, but he now heard the voices of the children of Ireland calling out for his help. He's hearing voices. That's crazy, man. In France, Patrick was mentored by St. Germain, who brought him before the Pope. Patrick was made a bishop by Pope St. Celestine I and sent to Ireland to convert the people to Christianity. There's another story here. This one's called St. Patrick's Golden Crocier. That's a weird word. I don't know what that means. Let's find out. Patrick was a humble and gentle man who traveled with a wooden walking stick called a sh shillelagh. That's a funny word. Why didn't they just call it a walking stick? This staff, however, was no ordinary stick. On his way back to Ireland, Patrick stopped on an island in the Tuscan Sea. Here he met a small community of people. These people were divided into two groups. One group was very old and the other was very young. Patrick stayed with them for the evening and had dinner. During the meal, he introduced himself to them. His host, one of the younger men, informed him that the older group of people were the children of the younger group. Patrick asked how this was possible. The man gave him a staff and told him a fantastic tale. The younger group of men had lived during the time of Jesus. One evening long ago, a traveler arrived. The men walked him in and fed him. For their hospitality, the traveler gave them his staff. The traveler was Jesus. He had carved the staff himself and had asked them to protect it until Patrick arrived. He told them that Patrick would need it in his work in Ireland. Jesus left a staff for St. Patrick? That's wild. The men had guarded the staff for over a hundred years, but had not aged. The staff had preserved their youth. This staff is what they gave to Patrick. In time, Patrick had a gold covering with jewels added to it. 
This is the Golden Corsier, a bishop's staff, which is so often pictured at his side. The staff itself was known as the Bacal Isu, the staff of Jesus. With it, St. Patrick worked many miracles. One story tells that a Celtic chieftain named Dichu tried to stop Patrick from continuing down the road. As he drew his sword and reached out to grab Patrick, the chieftain found that his arm was frozen in place. He could not move until he swore that he would obey Patrick in all that he asked. The chieftain, his son, and the entire clan converted to Christianity, becoming some of Patrick's strongest supporters. That's crazy, man. He, he wanted to hurt him, and then, then he started supporting him? There are other stories of Patrick wrapping the ground with the staff. At the spot where it touched the earth, fountains flowed from the ground. It has been compared to the staff carried by Moses and may have had similar properties. Wow, that's interesting. The Golden Corsair of St. Patrick was passed down to the bishops of Ireland. It was one of two symbols of office for the Bishop of Ireland. The staff and the angel's gospel, another relic of St. Patrick, were considered proof of holding the title of bishop if they were in a person's possession. The staff itself was considered so holy that the Irish people swore on Patrick's staff rather than the Bible when making an oath. The Irish people believed that great plagues would occur if someone lied while swearing upon the staff. Unfortunately, the staff is lost to us today. In 1528, during the Protestant Reformation, under the reign of King Henry VIII of England, the staff was destroyed when Archbishop Brown of the Church of England had it publicly burned after stripping it of gold and gemstones. That's sad. I bet that was a cool-looking staff with all that gold and gemstones on it. Looks like we got one more story about St. Patrick. And this one is the coolest one yet. It's called St. Patrick and the Snakes. As St. Patrick made his way across Ireland, he reclaimed many areas that had once been sites of Druidic worship. One such place was called Eagle's Mountain. Legend tells that Patrick had traveled a long way and was tired from his travels. It was just before Ash Wednesday, which meant that the season of Lent, a time of fasting and prayer, to prepare for Easter was starting. Patrick climbed to the summit of the mountain, seeking a quiet place where he could pray alone. He spent many days there in prayer and fasting. This become one of the, his favorite sites for the celebration of the mass. It is from this summit that St. Patrick is said to have prayed to God that no venomous reptiles be allowed to live on the land. To this day, there are no snakes or venomous reptiles in Ireland. No fossil of this type has ever been found in Ireland. The mountain was later renamed Croig Patrick, which means Patrick Stack. Another legend relates that St. Patrick slew a large serpent in Lou Derg, Red Lake, causing the waters of the lake to turn red with the creature's blood giving the lake its name. It's also possible this legend has a symbolic meaning. Patrick faced many Druidic priests and high priests who were said to have great magical powers. Stories speak of contests between them, pitting the power of God against the power of the Druidic spirits. According to the tales, Patrick walked through fire unscathed and banished demons that were summoned by the Druids. Wow, this guy was pretty tough. These demons were usually described as serpent or large snakes. So when it is said that St. Patrick drove the snakes from Ireland, it may have been a reference to actual reptiles, the Druidic cults, demons, or all three. Wow, that's a lot of cool stories about St. Patrick. He was interesting. I bet there's lots more stories about other, other Christian people who, who came and brought Christianity to other countries. I, I'll have to do some research and see what I can find 
but that was pretty cool. St. Patrick sounded like a really cool guy. All right, guys, I'm going to let you guys have the rest of your class with Mr. Boyd. Have a good day. I hope you enjoyed JB Storytime. Bye.